I'd like to call to order the regular meeting of the Bowling Green Board of Commissioners for December 18, 2018. I invite you to stand if you choose, and Commissioner Sue Perigen will be introducing someone tonight for us. Thanks to everybody here. I want to introduce a very special part of our community, Ms. Caroline Vaughn. She is a fifth grader at McNeil. She's 10 years old. She, uh, she loves her Lord. She volunteers at curbside ministries as well as walking dogs and, and other animals. She's an animal lover at the Humane Society. Um, and also very unique for, for uh, Ms. Vaughn is she's one of 10 children, seven of which were an entire family that her family adopted in August. So she's a sibling to seven new, and uh, she's here and would like to say the blessing and the Pledge of Allegiance. You're on. All right. Dear God, please bless the newly sworn in city commissioners and their families and all co community leaders. Guide them as they try to better our great city of Bowling Green. Please let them have listening ears and open hearts and minds for our community. Thank you, God, for this Christmas season and coming new year. Amen. Allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the Republic for which it stands, one nation under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Thank you. Please be seated. I think we should give her a little bit of a hand. Thank you, Caroline. Thank you, Caroline. Please call the roll. Commissioner Williams. Here. Commissioner Nash. Here. Commissioner Denning. Here. Commissioner Perigen. Here. Mayor Wilkerson. Words and recognitions that you'd like to bring to our attention, Mr. Meisel. I do, and I would like to just go ahead and merge that with my city manager comments, if that's okay. It kind of all blends into one. Understand First it. of all, I'd like to uh, uh, thank several people for all of their help with the Christmas open house and downtown lights up that we had uh, back on December, help me, 7th, last Friday. Seems like longer, longer than that ago, but we had a, a, a really good turnout uh, both at the open house and the downtown lights up. I'd like to thank uh, Kim Lancaster, Karen Foley, Emily Angel, Courtney Howe, uh, Laura, um, help me, Ashley, and, uh, and Jen Edwards, uh, Laura Harris and Jen Edwards for all their work on the open house here at, at City Hall. We had a huge turnout. Also like to thank the downtown mer merchants and uh, so many others for uh, everything else that happened at the same time that night. And I especially want to thank our Parks Landscape Division for all of their work on Fountain Square Park with the lights. It was unbelievable, uh, the, the amount of work and, and hours that go into that. And it's uh, just, it's, it's amazing to look at all the, the, the details. So I want to thank all those people for their, for their hard work. Uh, ne next, next thing is uh, actually earlier today we had some employees that were uh, recognized uh, that received their Rhodes Scholar, that's R-O-A-D-S -O Scholar, and their Roadmaster Training Program uh, completion uh, that they've been working on this year. And the following employees in the Public Works Department received that. Let me name them real quick. Barry Basham, Adam Jepson, Boris Boris Bird, Alan Papp, James Goddard, uh, Derek Sigstad, Sigstad, and Wes Jackson, and Jeff Walden. So I want to congratulate those guys for completing that program uh, in Public Works and receiving their Rhodes Scholars. Congratulations to them. And then and last but not least, uh, our chief of fire, uh, Chief Jason Colson, recently uh, received his chief fire officer designation from the Commission on Professional Credentialing. Uh, 
he demonstrated uh, education, leadership, management skills uh, that are needed and possess the requisite knowledge, skills, and abilities required for the fire and emergency services profession. Uh, took some classes and, and attained that credential, that designation. So I want to congratulate Chief Colson for that. That's all, that's all I have, Mayor. Okay, no other comments for city manager? Right no, there. sir. Yeah, yeah, uh, great news, great news. Um, Time and Money Magazine has named Bowling Green, Kentucky, the best place to live in Kentucky, in the Commonwealth. Um, each year they name a community from each state, and uh, our community was named that. So I, I just think that we should all be so proud of all of, the, all of the contributions of everybody across the leadership of this community that makes it such a great place to live. Is Angie Galexia here? Okay, I don't think she's made it yet, but we'll go ahead and get started. Mike Gardner from BGMU is here, and uh, they have received the Operation Pride Award for uh, beautifying our community on the commercial side for uh, probably this year because it was quite a project that they did. And I believe you've got a brief video that you'd like to display for people to see too do uh, and just to set this up uh, thank you mr. mayor uh, we are very proud in fact that uh, operation pride has recognized the tank we're, we're very proud that uh, the tank is the iconic symbol of Bowling Green and so wanted to keep it in good shape so uh, during the painting of the tank dr. Fayud Atala uh, who is a uh, uh, amateur uh, drone operator uh, contacted us and asked for permission if he could do some uh, videoing of the tank during various stages of construction. So we have a short video here for you this evening. Uh, just want to say too that uh, Dr. Uh, Atala has a longer version of this that has narration and whatnot. You can find it on YouTube. It's called Painting uh, a Water Tower. It's about 23 minutes long. It's a great exercise and uh, we're, we're very pleased with this. So. Uh, thank you for the recognition, and we thank Dr. Atala for providing this for our benefit and for the community. So, appreciate the upgrade on the tank too. It makes it makes it look nice downtown. Thank you. Thank you. <clears throat>
quite a project. It really makes downtown look great. Thank you so much for doing that. Thank you. Thank Dr. Atala for his interest in making the little historical document for us. We appreciate that. Uh, there are no city manager comments, so we'll have approval of minutes for our regular meeting December 4, 2018. I'll move. Second. Motion by Perigen, second by Williams. Any discussion? Please call the roll. Williams? Yes. Nash? Yes. Denning? Yes. Perigen? Yes. Wilkerson? Yes. Unless there's an objection, I'll be moving. Uh, item number 10, Municipal Order 2018-262 to the front of the agenda, please. Municipal Order approving the probationary appointments of Matthew Dillon Bond, Blake Comer, Brennan Elsis, Stephen Estes, Jonathan Harrell, Joseph Hernandez, Benjamin Hurt, Taylor Kaiser, Justin Meredith, Matthew Reynolds, Zachary Schaffet, and Charles Chase Voorhees to the position of firefighter in the fire department. Moved. Second. Nash second by Perigen. Mr. Mike. I'd like to ask Aaron Holsey, our HR director, to come up and make uh, the recommendation for appointment of these gentlemen. Good afternoon, Mayor and Commissioners. I am here to recommend 12 probationary appointments to firefighter. As you are aware, in 2018, the city applied and received funds through the SAFER grant, which would help fund the addition of nine new firefighter firefighters to the city of Bowling Green to staff a new future fire station. Part of that agreement to the grant is that we maintain our current staffing levels, which requires us to hire an additional three firefighters that retired or resigned this year. The human resources and fire departments conduct an extensive recruitment and selection process once a year in order to establish an eligible list for hiring in the next year. The process that we are completing today was started in June, um, and here are some of the details. Um, we had 345 applicants, which is 102 more than in 2017. Um, major congratulations to um, the administration of the fire department and Tiger Tooley of Human Resources for um, just really stretching out our um, getting more creative and where we're, where we're recruiting to, to get the best qualified candidates possible. Um, 219 completed the required tests which is 64% of the candidates, just a little bit higher uh, than last year. Uh, we forwarded um, 162 applications to the fire department for further consideration, and they selected 69 to do initial interviews with. Um, they also passed on an additional eight candidates that were previously interviewed, made it to a final stage, and, and that they moved along um, to, for consideration. Um, 44 candidates were given a full long interview in October. That's 14 more than we did in the previous year. Um, for 25 candidates, they went through the psychological and polygraph tests. And um, we are not placing any on an eligible list, but we are recommending 12 for the probationary appointments today. Um, in addition to all of the phases interviewed, they passed the state-administered candidate physical agility test, the CPAT, um, after eight-week period of preparation and practice testing. Um, the names of the recommended candidates for promotion, gentlemen, if you would like to stand as I call your names, um, Matthew Bond, Brennan Elsas, Jonathan Harrell, Benjamin Hurt, Charles Voorhees, Zachary Shuffett, Taylor Kaiser, Matthew Reynolds, Joseph Hernandez, Stephen Estes, Justin Meredith, and Blake Comer. What a crowd that you've got there. I believe this is the largest uh, potential class that we've had come through in the fire department. So are there any comments or questions for these gentlemen that are standing up? If not, let's take a vote. Please call the roll. Williams? Yes. Nash? Yes. Denning? Yes. Perigen? Yes. Wilkerson? Yes. Congratulations, gentlemen. <laughs> now, we understand that there's a, quite a crowd of people here, and we'll just give you a few minutes to step out because I don't want you to go to sleep during the rest of the meeting. So. <laughs>
go back to the regular order and uh, return for item number one, which is second reading of ordinance BG 2018-47. Ordinance rezoning real estate. Ordinance rezoning attractive land containing 1.83 acres from HI Highway Industrial to GB General Business located at 3031 Nashville Road, presently owned by Providence Home, Kentucky LLC, and Matthew Crabtree. So moved. Second. Motion by Perigen, second by Nash. This is a second reading on a unanimous recommendation from the Planning and Zoning Commission for rezoning. Are there any other comments or questions? Please call the roll. Williams. Yes. Nash. Yes. Denning? Yes. Perigen? Yes. Wilkerson? Yes. Second reading of Ordinance BG 2018-48. Ordinance amending Code of Ordinances. Ordinance amending Chapter 4, Alcoholic Beverage Control of the City of Bowling Green Code of Ordinances to authorize additional classes of licenses authorized by state law to revise one fee to comply with state law and, authorize, and further authorize the City Alcoholic Beverage Control Administrator to obtain criminal backgrounds on applicants for licenses. Second. Motion by Nash, second by Perigen. This is second reading of an ordinance that was explained last week. Is there any further comments or questions? Please call the roll. Williams? Yes. Nash? Yes. Denning? Yes. Perigen? Yes. Wilkerson? Yes. Second reading of ordinance BG 2018-49. Ordinance amending Code of Ordinances. Ordinance amending Chapter 2, Administration of the City of Bowling Green Code of Ordinances, making various administrative changes. So moved. Second. Perigen, second by Williams. Again, a second reading of items that were um, explained to us last week, basically uh, uh, clean up from different items. Are there any other comments or questions you might have? Please call the roll. Williams? Yes. Nash? Yes. Denning? Yes. Perigen? Yes. Wilkerson? Yes. These next series of municipal orders are our board appointments that we normally do uh, at our first meeting in January. However, the first meeting would be scheduled for January 1st. <laughs> Apparently, I was going to be the only one here, so we decided to cancel that meeting, but we don't want to leave these boards and commissions without representation, so we'll go ahead and put them on the agenda now and acknowledge them again in our first meeting in January. So the first one is Municipal Order 2018-256. Uh, Municipal order electing Sue Perigen as mayor pro tem. So moved. Second. Motion by Williams, second by uh, Denning. Um, it traditionally goes to the highest vote total in the uh, commission race, and I think that was Sue this time. Are there any comments or questions? Thank you. Yeah. Appreciate Please. the support from the community. Please call the roll. Williams? Yes. Nash? Yes. Denning? Yes. Perigen? Yes. Wilkerson? Yes. Can't say no. <laughs> <laughs> no, we'd, we'd, these are not ones you would abstain on. So, uh, yes. Does that mean when you out of town, she has to go on police calls? Uh, I told you have to stay on it till January first, Joe. <laughs> <laughs> it's still you, Joe. <laughs> Municipal Order 2018-257. Municipal order approving the appointment of Commissioner Sue Perigen to the Warren County Downtown Economic Development Authority, Incorporated. Second. Motion by Nash. Second by Denning. Any comments or questions? Please call the roll. Williams? Yes. Nash? Yes. Denning? Yes. Perigen? Yes. Wilkerson? Yes. Municipal Order 2018-258. Municipal Order approving the appointment of Commissioner Dana Beasley-Brown to the Barron River District Health Board and Job Development Incentive Program Committee. So moved. Motion by Nash, second by Perigen. I will explain Commissioner Beasley is here, Beasley Brown is here, and I did discuss these with her. She knows what we're doing this evening and had no objection to go ahead and moving forward. Any comments or questions, even from the commissioner? No. Nope. Please call the roll. Williams? Yes. Nash? Yes. Denning? Yes. Perigen? Yes. Wilkerson? Yes. Municipal Order 2018-259. Municipal order approving the appointment of Commissioner Joe W. Denning to the Bowling Green Audit Committee and Workforce Recruitment and Out Outreach Committee. So moved. Second. Motion by Perigen, second by Nash. Any discussion? Please call the roll. Williams? Yes. Nash? Yes. Denning? I have to abstain. Nope, you can vote on this one. Yes. Perigen? Yes. Wilkerson? Yes. Municipal order 2018-260. Municipal order approving the appointment of Commissioner Brian Slim Nash to the Bowling Green Warren County Drug Task Force and Job Development Incentive Program Committee. So moved. Second. Urgent second by Denny. Comments or questions? I'll miss you on the JBIP board, Slim. I'll carry on. Sorry. <laughs> Please call the roll. Sir.
that needs to. Yep. Did I overlook something? I apologize. No, I, it's, it's not, not on the agenda either. I missed it. Housing Authority. Okay. I will reread. Municipal order approving the appointment of Commissioner Brian Slim Nash to the Bowling Green Warren County Drug Task Force, Housing Authority of Bowling Green, and Job Development Incentive Program so Committee. Motion, original motion was by Perigen, second by Denning, and I presume that'll be the same. It's not on the agenda, but it is on the municipal order, so thank you. Thank you for pointing that out to us. Okay. Uh, any other comments or questions? Appreciate that helping us correct that. Please call the roll. Williams? Yes. Nash? Yes. Denning? Yes. Perigen? Yes. Wilkerson? Yes. Municipal Order 2018-261. Municipal Order approving the appointment of Mayor Bruce Wilkerson to the Bowling Green Municipal Utilities Board. So moved. Second. Motion by Perigen, second by Nash. Is there any discussion? Please call the roll. Williams? Yes. Nash? Yes. Denning? Yes. Perigen? Yes. Wilkerson? And 10 since we already did it so municipal order 2018-263 municipal order approving the reappointments of chuck coates and joe natcher to serve on the intermodal transportation authority incorporated board of directors and authorizing the submission of reappointments to the warren county judge executive so moved second by williams second by nash uh, we appreciate mr coates and mr natcher serving on the ita and we uh, appreciate their insight and input on there are there any comments or questions Please call the roll. Williams? Yes. Nash? Yes. Denning? Yes. Perigen? Yes. Wilkerson? Yes. Municipal Order 2018-264. Municipal Order approving the appointment of Mary Phoenix McCubbin to the University District Review Committee. So moved. Second. Motion by Perigen, second by Nash. I appreciate Mary Phoenix taking the place of Heather Rogers, uh, who has moved outside the state but still works in the, in the community, and this is the the appointment for the Greek Housing Corporation. So any comments or questions? Please call the roll. Williams? Yes. Nash? Yes. Denning? Yes. Perigen? Yes. Wilkerson? Yes. Municipal Order 2018-265. Municipal Order approving the appointment of Christine Huddleston to the Human Rights Commission. Second. Motion by Nash, second by Perigen. I've uh, been looking for someone with a legal background to help us on Human Rights Commission, and Ms. Huddleston has joined us this evening along with some other members of the Human Rights Commission. We appreciate your being here and willingness to serve. Thank you so much. Any comments or questions? Last time I talked to Ms. Uh, Huddleston, she was living overseas somewhere, and I texted, I texted her daughter, who I said I would because I saw him one day at a local restaurant and they were getting ready to leave to go back to their home overseas and I told their daughter that I would text her and uh, I did. So, good to see you. Glad to have you back in town and appreciate your service on the Human Rights Commission. Any other comments? Please call the roll. Williams? Yes. Nash? Yes. Denning? Yes. Perigen? Yes. Wilkerson? Yes, thank you again. Municipal Order 2018-266. Municipal Order approving revisions to the Risk Management Manual for the City of Bowling Green, Kentucky. So moved. Second. Motion by Perigen, second by Williams. Mr. Meisel. I'd like to ask uh, David Wisebrod, our Safety and Risk Manager, to, to come up and present these additions and revisions to our City's Risk Management Manual. This manual was adopted originally in 1995. We've made uh, numerous uh, additions and, and uh, revisions to it over the years, but these are the latest uh, recommendations that Dave has for you. Thanks, Dave. Mayor Commission, good evening. Uh, a few of, to summarize uh, a few of the uh, <clears throat> changes to the risk management manual. The first uh, section, bloodborne pathogens, we uh, basically included protocol to, uh, for conducting source individual testing. Um, in addition to that, we specified uh, additional components to be delivered directly from the healthcare facility, um, much of what was in place before, but it's actually in writing now. Um, secondly, under our CDL alcohol and drug testing policies, uh, since the city receives funding from uh, the Federal Transit Authority, 
and we have mechanics that are actually performing work on those vehicles. We had to comply with Federal Transit Authority drug and alcohol testing programs. So instead of instead of creating an additional drug and alcohol testing program, we just incorporated those those requirements that FTA included. We we included those into an existing drug and alcohol program, so we didn't have to create an additional program. Um, the FTA has actually reviewed these changes and uh, have have approved them. Um, lastly, in our regular drug, drug and alcohol free workplace program, we have added, uh, we have, uh, added protocol that would allow for an employee who has been with the city and, and for, for example, laid off or, um, and, 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 and is being rehired within 30 days of of exiting the city as an employee we've we're making an exemption where we would not have to do pre-employment testing on that individual if they've not been gone longer than 30 days and then lastly uh, the city's response following receipt of results indicating an inconclusive test uh, was clarified in our policies Question or comment about the policy? We've had this over the weekend to review and look at. So any other comments or questions? Thank you, sir. Please call the roll. Williams? Yes. Nash? Yes. Denning? Yes. Perigen? Yes. Wilkerson? Yes. Municipal Order 2018 267. Municipal order approving a contract through cooperative purchase with Motorola Solutions of Schaumburg, Illinois, through Mobile Communications of Bowling Green Incorporated of Bowling Green, Kentucky, under Kentucky State Pricing Contract for the purchase of nine portable radios in the total amount of $30,192.21. Second. Motion by Nash, second by Williams. Mr. Mazel. With the hiring of our additional firefighters, we're going to need some additional radios. We need uh, roughly nine radios, Motorola's, uh, that are compatible with our new 800 system. Uh, there is a state contract out there with Motorola to, to get these at $3,354 uh, $3, a piece. Uh, we need nine uh, of the, because we got, th we were anticipating three. Uh, existing ones that will be available uh, by the time these 12 get in and so we're asking for your approval to buy direct from Motorola through the state pricing contract. Comments or questions? Call the roll. Williams? Yes. Nash? Yes. Denning? Perigen? Yes. Wilkerson? Yes. Municipal Order 2018-268. Municipal order approving a contract through cooperative purchase with Paul Miller Ford of Lexington, Kentucky, under the Kentucky State Pricing Contract for the purchase of two Ford Explorers for the fire department in the total amount of $59,392. So moved. Second. Motion by Perigen, second by Nash. Mr. Mosel. These are also uh, vehicles for the fire department uh, to replace a couple of other older vehicles. These, again, are on uh, state contract through uh, Paul Miller Ford in Lexington uh, total price again is the 59 392 uh, which is roughly uh, 29 something a piece uh, ask for your approval on this as well I'll answer your questions Hello. Williams yes Nash yes Denning yes Perigen yes Wilkerson yes Municipal order 2018 269 Municipal order authorizing and accepting bid number 2018-44 for the Census Tract 112 sidewalk construction from Scott & Murphy Incorporated of Bowling Green, Kentucky in the amount of $573,029.20. Second. Motion by Nash. This is a continuation of our Neighborhood Improvements Program. Uh, we are now in Census Tract 112. Uh, we have provided a map for you in your packets uh, of that area. But what we're looking at here is 3,500 feet of new sidewalk curb and, curb and gutter on North Lee Drive, Crutzen Drive, North Sunrise Drive, and Woodway Street, where they intersect, I think, and then Old Barren River Road. Uh, this money, the 573,000, 500, is our um, CDBG money. Uh, 
community de development block grant money uh, that we are utilizing. And uh, Brent Childers and Nick Cook are here to answer any questions you have on this. We had only one bidder of, on this project, Scott Murphy at the 573029 are recommending them for, for uh, award. Do the new sidewalks connect to existing sidewalks? From our neighborhood and community services department. Yes, that's correct. So basically, we're installing the sidewalks in three locations. Uh, the first location is going to be connecting Glendalee Road to Lampkin Park. You may recall we finished earlier this year the Lampkin Park Pathways <coughs> project. So uh, the new sidewalks will actually uh, literally connect the neighborhood to Lampkin Park. Um, also, we'll be connecting Lee Point Apartments to the sidewalk on Glendalee Road. Uh, this will also improve safety for pedestrians that access curbside ministries at North Lee Drive. And then there's a section of sidewalk missing on Old Barron River Road. We'll be filling in that gap with this project. So did each one of these appear on our sidewalk inventory, and did they rank in such a way that we should be building them at this time? I'll have to defer to our public works director or Brent Childers on that. So whenever we did the planning for 112 and we were doing the neighborhood input and the staff input, we did pull the sidewalk projects that were on our sidewalk master plan list. And there were a portion of these that were on there, but however, the, the entire length of those did not. This is not under our new sidewalk program. This is under our neighborhood improvements program. So yes, there was a portion of these that were on that list, but not all of these were on the new sidewalk program list. If I count correctly, there are four <clears throat> sections of sidewalks. That's correct. My question is, and I think you've answered it, but I want to make sure, did these rank as one, two, three, and four on our sidewalk priority program? No. Our sidewalk priority program takes into account all the sidewalk requests across the entire city of Bowling Green. This is part of our 112 neighborhood improvement program, so we look at what is in 112 off that list to start our conversation. Uh, but we also look at well, where is things just because they're not on that list doesn't mean that they're not viable projects. It just means nobody's put them on the list. And so can I assume that these four projects, or, or would I be assuming incorrectly, are they the top four projects in Census Tract 112? I can't answer that right now to say yes or no. Uh, I will say that the North Lee, we looked at because North Lee is such a long stretch between Old Barron Road and Glen Lilly Road, that we saw that if we could build this section, which is the highest priority part of that section to connect Lee Point up to Glen Lilly, because Glen Lilly is sidewalked on both sides, then we felt like then the sidewalk program could then capitalize to complete out. And actually the city is either constructed or will be constructing sidewalk on North Lee from curb, uh, at curbside down to the next street. The next street on the Trent? Road. Trent, Trent. Trent. Uh, trying to go off memory here. Uh, so that was as part of, I think, the FY18 sidewalk program that those were introduced. So it's about making investments to, per to spur further investments with understanding of how the mechanics of the new sidewalk program work. Right. And would we be building a sidewalk on Crutzen if it were not for the curbside ministries program? Curbside's on Northley. I'm sorry, on Northley. I apologize. So Crudson, it's about connecting Lee Point. We saw that as a traffic generator. Whenever we pulled the neighborhood profile, we also saw a high percentage of population that didn't have access to a vehicle. So we felt like pedestrian facilities were important. That's why we've invested several hundred thousand dollars in pedestrian facilities. As we came up and developed the Lampkin Park project uh, to make the connection from uh, the, I guess, uh, Woodway area all the way out to Morgantown Road, old Morgantown Road. We saw those as well now we got access to the park facilities and through the park, but we still got to get them to here. So we went back to on off of Glen Lily and there's an entrance to Lee Point on Crudson and there's an entrance to Lee Point on North Lee. So we're building both of those legs really to connect Lee Point and the pedestrians there along and also those included along those paths back to Glen Lily. And then Glen Lily is the spine through 112, which then connects east-west 
down both sides. So did curbside ministries have anything to do with the building of a sidewalk? Absolutely none. Okay. I will say this. We did host a public meeting to uh, make the community aware of what sidewalks we were going to build at curbside, but they didn't participate in none of the discussion nor planning of where these sidewalks would be located. They just offered us space to set up a table with some pictures and maps. Understand what you're saying. Okay. My, my questions stem from a couple of different things, but, but the major point is that I have talked at length based upon citizen requests for sidewalks to be built. Mm -hmm. And each time I've asked about sidewalks to be built, I've been told they, they don't rank high enough on the list and that the list appears to be the end all be all as to how sidewalks are built in the city of Bowling Green. Mm -hmm. But then I see this item come up on the agenda and we seem to be working off different criteria. It is and, a separate program. That is and, correct. And so, but, but we've never discussed, but we've never talked about that there is a separate criteria or a separate program for the building of sidewalks. For years, it, it, correct me if I'm wrong, because I may be, we've been working off this one master list. You are correct. There is a master list out there uh, that Public Works uses as it makes its decisions on where to build sidewalks out of the city's new sidewalk program and the funding that is that is contributed by the city commission through the annual allocation through the budget. We are working through the neighborhood improvements program. We might not build sidewalks in the next neighborhood. We could do something completely different. We look at what what does this neighborhood need, this specific geographic area. In the last neighborhood, we did sidewalk spot improvements. We fixed 600 feet across 15 different locations. It might be a four foot section, it might be a 32 foot section, but we felt like that's what this neighborhood needed. So we wrote that program to be very flexible intentionally because the needs of every neighborhood are a little bit different. And you don't know what the needs of those neighborhoods are until you start walking the streets. We have staff go out, we work in teams, and we also meet with property owners and, and residents in those neighborhoods and ask them those questions. What is it? that this neighborhood needs. So it's not that there is this criteria, it's not like that. It's a very organic process of what are the needs of this neighborhood and can we accomplish it? We could not have accomplished building sidewalk all the way down North Lake. Understand. We felt like if we could pick this up and build sidewalk here, 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 and here, we could really make a connection to where now Everything down that neighborhood, if they can get to Glen Lily Road, they can get all the way to Walmart, they can get to the Tech School, they can get to Warren Elementary, they can get to Warren Central High School, they can get to the Dollar General. We've opened up pedestrian access to a lot of area that previously didn't have pedestrian access. We're trying to fill in pieces of, of projects that wouldn't have qualified under the new sidewalk program. We never would have built pathways in Lampkin Park. We still had to get through the park, but we were also able to have the flexibility to go in there and make those investments as we felt necessary for the benefit of the neighborhood. This isn't about the neighborhood. Are you defensive? No. Okay. I spent a lot of time on this program, so I got and a lot I know invested you have, in it. And, and I don't want my questions to, to put you on the defense. No. Uh, Can I ask a question to, real quick to piggyback city on manager. you? You, you, you did have uh, community meetings with the neighborhoods over there, and these were the streets that you heard most? It, 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 it's not that specific. Uh, we, we did have community meetings, and we heard about pedestrian improvements. We hear themes. We pick up things. We listen to people. What are the things? Uh, because if you ask somebody where do they want a sidewalk built, it's going to be wherever they live, sure. right in front of their house. We look at it from a much broader perspective of, of what are the areas where we can have influence. We know that we have a limited amount of money. Where can we have our influence? We can't build it all in pedestrian facilities. We still want to do new housing. We still want to do exterior rehab. We still want to do all these other things. And this is where we saw and listening to people about pedestrian facilities and looking at the data and understanding the dependence on pedestrian foot traffic for the neighbors in this area, we felt like this is where we could have the most impact in making these investments. With, with this specific CDBG pot of money that we are restricted on using in certain areas. That is correct. And we've used CDBG uh, for sidewalks uh, for a number of years. The boat landing sidewalk project was a CDBG sidewalk. Uh, we did the Kenton, is that right, Nick? Josephine. Uh, Josephine from 10th to Lane uh, and down all the way down to Lehman in the last area. Part of that was in the the list, the master list that we all talk about. 
uh, part of that was not, but we felt like that was a major connection that needed to be made. So we left ourselves some flexibility to decide where these investments should go. And I'm pleased to see that there are improvements being made to these neighborhoods. So it's it's yeah. not an object. In, in fact, these neighborhoods more so than maybe some others. Yeah. Uh, personally, I'm pleased to see the improvements being made. I'm just, I now understand why it's a different pot of money, but I don't understand why we didn't select the top four sidewalk sidewalk projects off the list as they fit in the census tract and why we use some other criteria to choose these particular four locations and without trying to go back to specifically two years ago i can tell you we do use the list uh, there's a representative from public works engineering as part of our team their job is to bring the list uh, sometimes it could be cost Sometimes it could be how can we accomplish as much as we try to. So we look at pieces and segments and how can we pull this together. So I can't give you a, a final answer from two years ago whenever we started the planning of all this. Thank you. Okay. One, one comment I might, I might make. It, it stands to reason that if you're making these improvements in these particular areas and you're using them for building sidewalks, then that helps stretch our sidewalk dollars that's in the other fund. So we may, instead of building the first three, four, five sidewalk projects that are on our regular fund, we might build the first 10 because of projects like this. So I'm glad to see you're stretching those dollars. Yeah. I just want to make sure that the people out there on, the, on their televisions are very clear that CDBG money, it's community development block grant that is issued through the federal government for specific programs that you're using in a specific neighborhood. The other is allocated by the, the other sidewalk program comprehensive is a public works program that is allocated through the city commission. I think a couple million dollars this year to extend. So it would, it would really reason that you would look at that specific block for community development block grants to improve whatever improvements that you can afford to do. And then the other is I guess a public works function, not a uh, community, not not in, under your umbrella, correct? Okay. Correct. So, only as a point of clarification, because I believe Commissioner Williams, who I agree with, and Commissioner Perrigan, who I agree with, but I believe are muddying my issue, okay. and and I and I don't want my issue muddied. Understand? <laughs> the issue is that we have a master sidewalk list, and mm -hmm. those are ranked in priority. Mm -hmm. And I understand that this is a different pot of money mm -hmm. because it's CDBG money. Mm -hmm. But there are pro sidewalk projects on that master list that fall within this census tract. Correct. And we could have easily picked the top four projects off of there or mm -hmm. moved down based upon funding and different things. And, but, but the answer to that question is we don't know. I, I can't say that I don't know. I'm telling you, I can't tell you exactly how we went about that. I know that we consult the list. I know we look at the list, but I can't tell you where these four pieces ranked on that list or if all of them were on that list. Back to my point earlier, that you only get on the list because you asked to be on the list. There could be a project that was never added that should be number one on the list, but nobody ever put it on the list for it to be ranked. But that is part of our evaluation of the neighborhood. We look at it, but I can't tell you exactly that I picked Two, one, two, and three out of this area that are on that list. I cannot say that. Please call the roll. Williams? Yes. Nash? Yes. Denning? Yes. Perigen? Yes. Wilkerson? Yes. Municipal Order 2018 270. Municipal order authorizing a contract through non competitive negotiations with American Engineers Incorporated of Glasgow, Kentucky for professional services related to property acquisition services for Shive Lane corridor improvements in the amount of $48,620. So moved. Motion by Perrigan, second by Denning. Ms. Meisel. As you know, we have the Shive Lane corridor uh, in budget to uh, widen and, and, and do that in the coming months. And with that comes the need for uh, property acquisition uh, of right away uh, we have found that it's it's much more expedient and efficient to uh, hire someone to do that. And Public Works has found the firm American Engineers that they feel like is the best to perform these services for us for this project on Shive Lane. Uh, we've used uh, similar companies like this uh, to do um, similar services for like um, Small House Road 
right away acquisition and planning. And so uh, American engineers were also involved with the design work on this project. And so Public Works is recommending to uh, use them for this stage of the project at 48,620. And Greg Meredith is here uh, to answer any questions you might have. I'll answer questions. This is for the section between Scottsville Road and Ken Bale Boulevard, correct? It doesn't go all the way to <coughs> Bridge Road. Okay. Yeah. No, uh, Mayor, this just goes from Scottsville Road to Ken Bale, where the roundabout will be located at the end of job there. So. Please call a roll. Williams? Yes. Nash? Yes. Denning? Yes. Perigen? Yes. Wilkerson? Yes. First reading of Ordinance 2018-50. Ordinance closing a public right-of-way. Ordinance approving the closing of a portion of Old Kentucky Street right-of-way located from the intersection of East 4th Avenue to approximately 700 feet west of the intersection of Kentucky Street and Louisville Road and West Riverview Drive. Move. Second. Motion by Nash, second by Williams. Mr. Meisel. This is the old portion of uh, Kentucky Street that runs in front of the old Kentucky Tire Exchange that Planning and Zoning is proposing that we close um, all the staff report is in your packet and uh, Ben Peterson is here to answer any questions you might have comments or questions yes sir what about the businesses that are located on that uh, stub street that used to be loop street back mm -hmm. in the 50s and 60s yeah, the, the businesses is, is who generated the request to close this so uh, they will just convert that into a combination of travel ways and parking for those businesses to uh, to give themselves more uh, more room for for parking and to, to supplement their business well will they come out on second street uh, exit well <clears throat> they'll just come back out the, the way they came that came in on the on the Kentucky I believe on the Kentucky Street side it was just basically it's converting it to a private travel way instead of a public right of way. It, it, it won't it won't be necessarily closed it, it or reconfigured in any way. Uh, mm -hmm. Comments? Overall? Williams? Yes. Nash? Yes. Denning? Yes. Perigen? Yes. Wilkerson. Yes. Municipal Order 2018-271. Municipal order accepting donation from Hills Pet Nutrition for improvements to Hills Bark Park located at HP Thomas Park. I'll move. Urgent second by Nash, Mr. Meisel. Yes, uh, we are very pleased that Hills Pet Nutrition has uh, um, offered another contribution towards our, our, our dog park on HP, at HP Thomas Park. Uh, they are proposing that they think they might can do up to $7,500 and we would throw in about $3,000 to do some uh, upgrades to that park. Uh, there's two areas. Well, there's a large dog area, a small dog area. Uh, some One doesn't have uh, shade as, as well as the other one does and seating. Uh, so we're proposing that we're going to install two shade structures on concrete <coughs> pads. Um, <laughs> And do some upgrades with some planting and trees, and and provide and improve that uh, both sides of the dog park, the the large and the small dog areas. And I think there could be some hills people here tonight. Is there? Yep. I see them over there. Yes. Thank you all for right. all your help. With you got it. <laughs> so we appreciate their their partnership with us. Uh, they originally had donation to the park if you'll remember when we first constructed the park over there the dog park and really appreciate their support and in, in improving this this area of our community and our park system this has been a great partner with us for a long time and a great community brent, so thank brent, you so much brent belcher is here to answer any specific questions you might have about about the, the project itself what we're going to do but that's the basics are in your packet and the memo i'm gonna can i make a comment Thank you all so much. I was over there Sunday, and I'm telling you, it was packed in there. And, you know, those dogs just have a great time getting to run. And uh, thank you. From one dog lover to another. <laughs> and and Miss Caroline Vaughn's a dog lover, too. Any other comments or questions? Please call the roll. 
Williams? Yes. Nash? Yes. Denning? Yes. Perigen? Yes. Wilkerson? Yes. Thank you again. Municipal Order 2018-272. Municipal Order authorizing the acceptance of 2019 grant funds from the Appalachia High Intensity Drug Trafficking Area through the Office of National Drug Control Policy in the amount of $36,000. Second. Motion by Nash, second by Perigen. Mr. Meisel. Just another good opportunity to use other people's money, uh, $36,000 with no match, and this would be used to pay for overtime expenses of our uh, BGPD officers that are assigned to our drug task force, and uh, it's in the amount of $36,000. It goes towards salaries, paying overtime, all that kind of stuff, and I uh, want to kudos to uh, Nick Cook for working on this again and, uh, and bringing this in another year so recommend approval comments or questions please call the roll williams yes nash yes denning yes perigen yes wilkerson yes. municipal order 2018-273 municipal order authorizing and directing city staff to initiate an evaluation of the existing cad software system reviewing the motorola cad system available on the kentucky state pricing contract and based on findings that the Motorola CAD system meets the city's needs, negotiating an agreement for review by the Board of Commissioners. I moved. Second. Perigen, second. We have had our current CAD system uh, for roughly 22 years now, 1996, and I think Mayor Wilkerson has, had mentioned that he was part of that implementation. Three. But um, we are at a point now uh, First of all, I urge you to read the memo from Amelia Bowen. Uh, it's very, it's it's very good information. But we are in, at a critical point uh, with this system. Uh, we're kind of at our wits' end with our current uh, provider, and we need a new uh, CAD system. So we are asking you tonight to uh, give the okay for us to to start that process. Uh, once we find one, we think that that one will be Motorola. Uh, we're pretty, probably 90, 95% sure it'll be Motorola. It's on a state uh, pricing contract that we can go out and get and move along with it. And uh, we're asking you tonight uh, for your support to do that. Uh, Amelia's here if you have any specific questions, but basically we're running into just some reliability and some basic uh, problems that shouldn't be existing. Uh, we've, I think, probably have outgrown this current system uh, with the growth we have and the volume that we take in now. And we need a system that can, and then can cover the volume that we take and be uh, reliable and, uh, and not have any of these uh, failures and service gaps that we're uh, experiencing currently. So. We need to move on this fast, so we need your, your all's approval tonight to, to start negotiations with Motorola and, and, and get the system that we need. Uh, we have money set aside for this in multiple funds, including the two 911 funds, um, along with the tech fund, and uh, we don't think this will have very much impact to the, to the general funds. So we think we can pull this off with the, the fund balances and, and the other funds, and so we ask for your you're okay to, to move along and, and get this thing started tonight. Amelia, do you have anything to add? Comments or questions? Ever support, please call the roll. Williams? Yes. Nash? Yes. Denning? Perigen? Yes. Wilkerson? Yes. Municipal Order 2018-274. Municipal Order amending procedures relating to annual funding of nonprofit entities receiving city appropriations. So moved. Second. Perigen, second by Williams, Mr. Mazel. I'm going to ask uh, Katie Shaller Ward, our mm -hmm. Assistant City Manager CFO, to, to brief you on the changes that we're proposing here, uh, revisions to our agency funding procedure. If you will, Katie. We're getting ready to kick off our fiscal year 2020 <coughs> budget planning process. We do that about six months ahead of the June adoption time period. And during that process, um, we have a process procedures in place on how the agency funding portion of that process is handled and based on some decisions that were made during this fiscal year FY19 I'm proposing revisions to the agency funding procedures to remove community action from the extra process of submitting an application and other documents part as part of the agency funding process because they will be doing um, 
a process through the federal grant application process. So I didn't feel like they needed to be jumping through hoops and doing both of those things so they would stay under the federal transit, um, transit services process versus this agency funding process. Comments or questions? Does it reduce in any way the amount of money they receive or the potential amount of money they receive for public transportation? I would say it could, but it is not at this point anticipated. Because of the process? or Because it would be tied to the grant application process and there has to be certain matching funds in order to maximize the amount of grant funding we can receive. So the board would still have separate approval of that process like we did this last year. We just wouldn't go into that process with agency funding consideration ahead of time. It would be done on its own merits. This is mainly the money that for, for the operating piece that has to be matched. So we have to give them the appropriate amount to, to draw the, the federal funding. Around the federal fiscal year, which is in October, whereas this would be in hours in yes. earlier in the year. Any other comments or questions? Please call the roll. Williams? Yes. Nash? Yes. Denning? Yes. Perigen? Yes. Wilkerson? Yes. Municipal Order 2018-275. Municipal Order Approving Amendments to the City of Bowling Green, Kentucky Manual of Purchasing Policies and Procedures. So moved. Second. Perigen, second. I'm going to bail out on this one, too, and hand this off to Katie to, to give you an overview of the changes. The, rest, the last revisions to the purchasing policies was completed in 2014, and we do try to do periodic reviews of city policies to eliminate redundant, obsolete language and update things uh, to keep the policies current. So we propose revisions, um, mostly administrative housekeeping changes, uh, but we, and we've incorporated some new policy changes that were approved back in the spring specifically uh, regarding the implementation of a pre-qualified contractor requirement. Uh, the board was made aware of that previously in the, in the year, and so we implemented that, and we're now following up with the formalization of that in the policy. Uh, we are also uh, making some changes as uh, based on the ordinance you approved tonight on the city manager dollar level threshold for approval. Other required changes incorporate some federal purchasing language required by, to be incorporated by the end of this calendar year, uh, and that's in relation to any grants, federal grants that we receive. There are certain policies and procedures that we're required to follow for those grant funds being spent. Nick is here if you have, Nick Cook is here if you have any questions specifically on that piece. Uh, some other changes, uh, also a recent decision by the board to um, repeal the Administrative Appeals Board. We had to redefine an, uh, an appeal process for vendor appeals in the policy, so we've done that. And if you have any other questions, uh, or if I can answer any additional questions, uh, our procurement manager, Marilyn Perigen, is here, and she can help with answering some specifics as well. Questions? Welcome, Ms. Perigen, to show up. We appreciate you being here tonight. Call the roll. Williams? Yes. Nash? Yes. Denning? Yes. Perigen? Yes. Wilkerson? Yes. First reading of Ordinance BG 2018-51. Ordinance annexing property by consent. Ordinance annexing a total of approximately 6.58 acres of property located at 618 Lovers Lane with property presently owned by Preparo to Bowling Green LLC, with said territory being contiguous to existing city limits and further approving an associated economic development annexation incentive agreement. So moved. Second. Second. William second. This is the property on Lover's Lane uh, that is now being um, you, you sort of, uh, inhabited by Arcadia. And uh, Brent Childers has been working on this for quite some time. Uh, and I'm going to ask that he step up and give you an overview of, of uh, this annexation. It, it's, uh, it, it's taken a while, but we're glad to get it. It's six and a half acres uh, running Lover's Lane. I'll let Brent explain. July of 2017 is when I first initiated conversations with them about this uh, possibility of annexation. Got the signed consent form December of 2018. So roughly 18 months later, uh, a lot of phone calls, a lot of conversations of, with various members and people along the way. Uh, but we feel like it's a good addition to the city of Bowling Green. Preparo 2 is the 
is the owner of the property. Uh, Arcadia Senior Living Facilities is the operator of the property. So it is a ownership lease deal. Uh, but we eventually worked through Arcadia to get this realized. Uh, they saw the value of being inside the corporate limits of Bowling Green, the services we provide, and the return on their investment that they get and the protection for their investment they get by being in the city limits of Bowling Green. So I want to thank them for their uh, understanding as we go through and do this. Uh, the, I will say that the, uh, the growth along Lover's Lane, I've had a lot of annexations lately along Lover's Lane. I've got a couple more holes to go, uh, but this surely was a big one. So I'll entertain any questions or anything anybody might have. Work on that. We appreciate it. Comments or questions? <coughs> Please call the roll. Williams? Yes. Nash? Yes. Denning? Yes. Perrigan? Yes. Wilkerson? Last voting item on our agenda. We have a work session tonight, but I think we only have one public commenter. So if you want to come and we'll do that while they're getting set up. Come on up. Jennifer, come on up. <clears throat> All right. <clears throat> My name is, as you know, Jennifer Moreland, and I'm writing a book. Well, I'm writing a book, and I'm actually... I published a book, and now I'm working on my second book. Now, it has nothing to do with it, but it does show you something that um, I am trying to do something. Um, so the whole thing is what we need to do with the Tenant Act is we need to get all the landlords together and agree and get all the tenants together and have a meeting and discuss the difference and stuff like that. That's what we need to do. Dana's gonna be in office next month, so get ready for change. So, you know, police, the police, they need double pay, at least on Christmas. I mean, come on, people. Double pay on Christmas. That's all we're asking. And if you can't do that, at least get a mail for pizza or something. They're saving your butt every day um, with traffic and everything like that, and you, you're not going to put a meal in front of them for Christmas? You know, I just don't understand. I don't understand the city commissioners. I don't. And then on top of it, S Slim said something really smart, and Sue said something, and I was just like, I could not believe the way you did it. But Slim stood the ground, and I'm proud of you, Slim. So, you know, but the whole thing is, the whole thing is um, the housing assistance program should be improved at life skills, okay, should be improved. The homeless people are getting as worse than it is. People are living in people's empty buildings, and they're asking to stay in empty buildings right now. So we got to do something about the homeless. If we're not going to put a homeless center, a homeless shelter, least put funding in programs that work, okay? And that's what we need to do. Transportation, Lover's Lane. We need better transportation to Lover's Lane. The bank is going to be there. The um, clinic is going to be there. We need better transportation to Lover's Lane. And I've been trying to tell you that, and I've been talking to Dana, and slim and they both agree that there should be better transportation and I'm not asking a lot I'm asking one of you to have a meeting with the director of the transit and talk to them that's all I'm asking you know and two I'm doing this because the woman I love is going to be lost because of all this time has expired so Thank you, very much. you know I'm just saying. We're going now into our work session, and I believe we have a discussion tonight on signage. Mr. Childers, are you doing this tonight? I am. I thought that you were bringing all the signs in tonight. Yeah, so you'll get to hear me talk some more. I know you're excited about that. That's your early Christmas present. How about that?
Actually, is there a clicker up here? No, it doesn't look like it. I can run it over here if I need to. All right, I think we're ready. <clears throat> Sorry. <We're> good. <laughs> I'm here till whenever. Everybody good? All right, thank you, Mayor, Commissioners, uh, Mr. City Manager, for the opportunity. You know, I get the opportunity to stand before you all on many different topics, many different things. Uh, some uh, stand here before you excited and enthused about bringing new ideas and new opportunities. Tonight is not one of those nights. Uh, this is not a discussion that I look forward to having over the coming months, but it's a discussion that we must have as a community. Uh, it's, it's the reality that we face as a community who desires to balance uh, economic purpose with community aesthetics uh, and, and also balance what is allowed under the law. Uh, for the protection of ourselves as a community, but also for the protection of the individuals that call this place home. Uh, so I'll get started in this. Sometimes whenever you talk about sign regulation, this is kind of what it feels like. Uh, you really don't know where to go, where to get started, what direction you should go on or how you should go. But in this one, it's a little bit different <clears throat> in that there's kind of a motivator <laughs> behind it. Uh, and this is a, is, is a tough thing to regulate. Uh, neighborhood and Community Services has an enforcement authority over a variety of topics. Uh, signs, temporary signs, uh, is one of ours. Uh, it's a long list, but it is by far one of the most difficult uh, that we have. Uh, it is challenging. But the motivating force behind all this is what's called Reed versus Town of Gilbert. This changed everything for every community that desires to have sign regulation. This really kind of changed the course of everything. And we'll kind of talk about this, but our main focus is going to be on temporary signs, uh, right of way, and private property. Okay, so I'll give a little bit of background of what Reed Gilbert is. So go back to 2005, uh, about 13 years ago, Gilbert, Arizona, which I looked up uh, this afternoon, is the largest town in the U.S. It is not a city, it is a town. Uh, so it's the largest town in the U.S. that adopted sign regulations, like many other communities have. And then uh, Gilbert cited a church. If my memory serves me correct, this church is, is not the, the church where you think of where they have a permanent location with the steeple and the parking lot and all that. Uh, if my memory serves me correct, this church kind of was a community church, a small church. It was really a group of people who gathered to, to worship and those locations changed. And so they would utilize signage to tell people where they were meeting. That's kind of where it all started from. Uh, so they got cited by the city, or I'm sorry, the town of Gilbert. Uh, the pastor, Reed, hence Reed versus Gilbert, uh, challenged it. So it started at, I'm assuming, some equivalent to a code enforcement board, a local civil action here uh, at a municipal level. Ten years later, it is before the United States Supreme Court on religious freedom and uh, First Amendment rights for freedom of speech. So that's really where all this ended up is freedom of speech, uh, which freedom of speech is one of the founding principles in the U.S. Constitution. Uh, that is what this country is built on and is, and is one of the principles that we must adhere to and follow along to, and that's what makes this uh, so difficult. Uh, we don't expect this to be end, the end of it all. Uh, we expect to continue legal action uh, across. Uh, there's case law is building on this, uh, on signs. Um, it feels like I've dealt more with Supreme Court cases in the last couple of years than I ever have before. So it's been an interesting change. So what this really does says signs must be content neutral. So you can't distinguish signs based on what they say because that's a free speech issue. So 
Uh, you can't have different size signs for different types. So a campaign sign can't be one size and a real estate sign be another size or a charity sign another size or a different location or time because then the only way to distinguish what is a campaign sign or what is a auction sign or a real estate sign or any of those things is you have to read the sign. You have to look at it and it says vote for X. How do you know if it's a personal expression sign? Well, you have to read it and it says, I hate Brent Childers. Then you know somebody's expressing uh, their personal opinion. It's common opinion, but you know, it is personal. Uh, so you have to read it. That's where the content neutral comes from. So in, through the decision, <clears throat> there's discussion of, well, if you use content-based, then it must meet strict scrutiny. And that's an even more challenging and higher bar to achieve as part of this. So for the purposes of this discussion, we're going to focus on this content neutral. Uh, can't restrict locations based on types of signs. Basically, it's all or nothing, and any type of temporary sign is allowed or any type of temporary sign is prohibited. If you have to read the sign to determine if it's legal, then your ordinance is wrong. Okay? That's a simple kind of phrase to go by, a simple motto to think about. If you have to read the sign to determine if it's legal or not, then your ordinance is incorrect. So in the room, we have six, six signs, representations of signs. This is what we will have to be looking at as, as in terms of content neutral. They are blank spaces to us. We can look at how big we want them to be, where we want them to be, but if we have to read the sign to determine if it's okay or not, then we're not doing what we need to do under this new case law. Uh, we're not including on-premise business signage or billboards. We feel like those already meet the content neutral, so really this is talking about temporary signage. So we'll get into some examples. This is, I want to go ahead and uh, introduce my disclaimer. Uh, none of the pictures shown here in the presentation were taken in Bowling Green. These were all taken off of Google Images. So I don't, by no means I'm trying to call out any local businesses or organizations here. Um, so, but these are what we consider typical temporary signs in our community. Uh, you'll see your standard in the picture to the left with the star, uh, your standard shopping center sign where you see all the businesses listed there. That would be a permanent on-premise business sign. Uh, then you see the feathers. Those are kind of the flag things. Those are called feathers. And then you have a couple of banners and some stick-in signs. Those we would consider uh, what it looks like in this picture is on-premise commercial advertising. But then you also run into this weekend charity car wash signs or vote for signs. Uh, this impacts you all as well because you all are elected by the by the citizens of this community, and signs is a part of a marketing strategy for a campaign. We understand that. Uh, so in the lower right, you see campaign signs. But there's other types that could be construed as signs. Banners, pennants, the wacky, waving, inflatable, flailing arm tube man that uh, seemed to pop up all over town. Uh, the balloons, those all could be construed as signs. So it's not always just what, the, what something says or how I read it. It can be another object. Yes, ma'am. Flag a sign, an American flag? For the purposes of this, we're leaving American flags out. Uh, but as part of, uh, I'll, I'll go into that in a later detail, okay? We're really talking about signs as part of this. Yes, the feathers are temporary signs. Uh, very popular, too. We see a lot of those out in the, in the community. <clears throat> so Ben put this together for me. These are current zoning regulations for temporary signs. You can see all the different maximum sizes allowed for uh, what the type of sign is. This is where we really need to fix some things to protect ourselves underneath this new Sup U.S. Supreme Court decision. Um, <clears throat> we'll kind of come back to that. So really, it kind of comes down to a few things. Size. What is the maximum size? The, the, what you have pictured here, you can see the numbers up in the corner. 
to show you the square footage of those. So you could have an understanding of what a 32 square foot sign looks like, a 16 square foot sign. You don't have to make this decision tonight. This is just an introduction to this topic. An eight square foot, a six square foot, a four, a two, to understand uh, what we're talking about whenever we say a, a 32 square foot sign, uh, to give you a representation of what that looks like. Uh, because the size is the size. If you go back to this slide, you see 32, 32, 16, 16, none, 16, 32, 32. There will be one size chosen. Location. As a, as a maximum. As a maximum, that's correct, as a maximum. Sir. Before you do that, can the size be different in different zoning areas? Because I could imagine that in a residential area, you'd want a smaller sign, but in a commercial area, you'd like a larger sign. Now that's where we need some direction uh, on what is the preferences. So we kind of know how to form this because I understand it also, there's also other ways to look at it. Uh, signs are also sometimes derived based on speed uh, you know, if I have a, if I'm wanting to put a sign up on a higher speed roadway and I use three inch letters, I just wasted my time putting up a sign. I needed larger letters. We do this with street signage, warning signage, things like this as part of our traffic signs. Uh, but so as we go through this, we're going to need uh, information from you all to kind of lead us in the direction that this city wants to go in. We hope that we use this as an opportunity for us to determine what is, how do we want temporary signs in our community? Uh, and use this as an opportunity, not just as that pesky U.S. Supreme Court and that pesky Constitution down here telling us how to do things, but really guide us in how do we want our community to look? Because this does have an aesthetic component to it as a community, but it also has a, there's economics, there's a lot of other things behind the scenes. Commissioner Perriger. Yeah, isn't it? Is, am I correct in that in today's version of our sign ordinance, the maximum size sign within the city limits is the um, 32? I, I don't remember what was 32. on that slide. So yeah. right now, only the county can accommodate <clears throat> that. No, I believe there is a 32 in the city I didn't think real estate. We were... Real estate auction on site and real estate auction off site are up to 32. But a campaign sign is 16. And the only way to tell the difference between a campaign sign and a real estate sign is to read it. There you go. So once you once we pick it, it's it. I don't see many of those inside the city limits. Is I, in my mind is what we I'm still thinking. see them on real estate. Uh, that's where we see them most of the time. Auction signs, auction. especially, are probably uh, auction signs and also large parcel real estate for sale signs. Uh, we'll see them there. We don't see them in you know a, a small uh, for sale or anything like that. Sorry, I'm clicking the wrong one. Right now one. they can have up to four. Yes, uh, we'll kind of get to that next point. Anything else on the size? You're looking at content, you know, our, our prohibition on off-premise signs would go have to go away because it's content related. Am I, I, I share that same opinion. There are some ways to do that, but that creates other challenges. Uh, so we'll talk about location. One big question is, do we want to allow signs in the right of way? And you don't get to pick what signs. If you allow one, you allow everybody. So that means somebody can put a, I hate Brent, Child I hate Brent Childers. If you say yes, they're allowed, then they can put 8,000 of them up and down the right of way. I hate Brent Childers. And there probably would be 8,000 people out there that would be willing to do that. But. Um, this is where the discussions really start to get difficult. We've allowed in this community uh, some exceptions for a number of years. We've codified some of those in our own ordinances to allow for these. Uh, we've codified them under policies or what methods of enforcement uh, for a lot of organizations to be able to take advantage of some of these opportunities because it's all in the goodness of the community. But the reality is we have to treat these as they are blank canvases that we are looking at. And if we have to read them, then we're wrong. And so we have to really kind of change how we look at this. Uh, and so then that's where it becomes very difficult. And we'll kind of move on to that. So location is <clears throat> if we say no, uh, which I will say that would be my recommendation. Uh, I don't have a lot, but I will say that would be my recommendation is no signs in the no 
The only signs allowed in the right of way would be those installed by a governmental entity. We still should allow speed limit signs, stop signs, those types of signs to be installed in the right of way. I will say that. I think we're all on board with that. Uh, also number, uh, currently we allow four uh, to be permitted, four temporary signs for commercial. Uh, that's under court, that's kind of our current standard. You can do four per parcel, uh, but there's some fluctuations and opportunities uh, there. So we'll move into the, the fun part of this, the hot button issues uh, that is gonna make this discussion not all tonight, but over the course of the coming months, uh, a lot of fun is the charitable organization. So I touched on that. We as a community have allowed uh, charitable organizations or community interest groups to advertise uh, in the right of way because we feel like it's the best thing for the community. Uh, this new rule uh, would, if we allow one, we gotta allow everybody. So it's an all or none. So that creates a challenge for those. Also event signs, whenever it's football weekend uh, and the toppers are playing at home, you see game tonight, hot rods, you know, a lot of different organization, event type signage. Uh, the Lions Club benches, uh, to, they are scattered around the community. Uh, they do a wonderful job of raising money, and doing things for the community, but they are advertising businesses in the right of way. That creates another challenge for us under this, under this decision. Uh, political candidates, yourself included, your peers, uh, the other people that you work with are gonna have a vested interest in this, but also our, our real estate companies, our auction companies that depend, that see this as a method of their marketing uh, for the purposes of selling property, and, but also just general business interest for anybody that's trying to sell something in a kind of a highway business type designation, not as much on your office side, but on your highway business, your gas stations, your fast foods, your car lots. That's where we tend to see a lot of temporary signage in, in those types of industries. Brent, I don't see it on here, but what about uh, Operation Pride signs? Well, that creates another uh, challenge to everything uh, as part of this. Uh, I think that our Operation Pride signs is something that we would like to, and I'm making an assumption, so please tell me I'm on the right path or on the wrong path, but I think we would like to continue to have those in our community, but that's gonna be a challenge in how we craft this, uh, of how we do that. Uh, so it's not something that we haven't thought about, we just don't know the answer. And I'm not coming tonight with a recommendation nor all the answers to all this. There's a lot of, uh, things that we just have to have conversations about in the coming months. Uh, I would suspect that members of these groups uh, will be very vocal and outspoken about their desire to be treated differently, to be exceptions, because that's how we've operated for a number of years in this community, just like every other community. Uh, but it all changed uh, in 2015. That Supreme Court case really changed everything. And so you really have to think about this in terms of this is what I'm regulating and where does it go? And that's the best way I've found to kind of boil it all down to something that makes sense. But that's not gonna change the desires of people that represent these organizations and their uh, passions or their incomes that are dependent on that as part of their strategy. Uh, and those are gonna be difficult conversations for us as a community. Uh, Go ahead. This, uh, this Supreme Court case, this was a Supreme Court case. U.S. Supreme Court. Was in 2015, and you say you anticipate more litigation coming, um, but that's, that's four years ago. Have, have we had issues in those four years since this court case till? Have we? Yeah. Uh, we have sign issues all the time. Well, I, I know we have <laughs> questions about signs. I know that. Have we had it. legal issues? No, we have not had legal have, issues. Have other communities? Yes. Okay. Uh, because what has happened is most communities are, we're in the same boat. You know, we're kind of out here. Some in Kentucky have already adopted new sign regulations. Some have not. Uh, but we're getting wind of some uh, attorneys that are taking advantage of those that have not and filing action against those uh, for settlement claims. That's where I was going with that, is that the, the danger for us to do nothing is that we Cost could of be doing nothing is greater than the cost of doing something correct. That is right. Does the KLC It's always have, gonna be that way. It, it is. 
uh, somebody will not lack the size uh, measurement of a sign, they're going to take you to court. Yes, but, but it's, a, it's about putting ourselves in the most defensible position. But, you know, those things happen, and we just have to be prepared uh, and make sure we're doing what we think is right by the law and let it happen. Brent, does KLC have a, uh, a position on this or a... Um... No, I will say that the Inter International Municipal IMLA has, has on their sixth draft of a model ordinance and in their preamble to that sixth draft, they said we've come to the conclusion that we cannot develop a model ordinance uh, because of the complications related to this. Uh, so use this as a tool to think about things as you go through this discussion. Uh, so this is not an easy thing because we run into the thousands of what ifs and not just the thousands of what ifs. Then you run into the personal side of those organizations that we all value, the commercial interests that we value, all the things that we value in this community being in conflict with what we're trying to do to achieve the law. Commissioner Nash. Two questions, uh, and if you answered them while I stepped out, I apologize. Does this have anything to do with signs that people are holding? I'm going to say no. Ben, you confer. I would say due to the extreme difficulty of enforcement of those, typically the answer is no. If there's a specific position, hey, you're in violation, take two steps over. And, and take that one step further, what happens with holding sign for a company in bankruptcy and they're sitting there with a federal order uh, authorizing them to have people carrying signs? Thanks, Gene. Yeah. The, the question w was not specific to panhandling, but that's an issue that comes to mind. But there are also other businesses who have people that are holding signs that are both on, pardon me? Right, that are both, I see them on both public property and, and private property and right of way. Yeah. Uh, no, we don't take action on, we consider human signage, human signage. We just don't take action on it. Yeah. Uh, the sign flippers, some are really good, some are really talented. Uh, I guess I hope they make top dollar. Uh, <laughs> but hate to see no. you take in the statue. This would liberty. really be about the placement of signs, not the holding of signs. Uh, I said two questions. The second one? At some point. It'll come back. I'll be here. <laughs> I'll right. be here all night. All right. And, and are there restrictions that are different for? public property versus private property? That's where the really the differentiation is right of way versus uh, private property. Uh, so the other form of public property would be like our parks or city hall or things like that. And I don't think we want to allow everybody in town to put signs up in front of city hall. Uh, Brent, can I ask this? If I'm, yeah. a, if I'm a nonprofit, say kids on the block, I'm having a event and I know, I, you know, a lot of times you see them down on Scottsville Road right of ways and all. But if I go into that business, say, Rite Aid or Walgreens or whatever, and I say, manager, could I move this back just off the right of way and plant my sign here, that would still be legal? It would be on private property. That brings up the, the point that Bruce was bringing up about off-premise advertising. So if we allow the charitable or whoever to say, okay, you can't be on right of way, you gotta be on private property, and then they go to whatever organization, whatever uh, business and say can i advertise my event on your property right. and we say yes we want to allow that then we've just undone the off-premise advertising i don't know what you mean by off-premise advertising okay. you have to define that so currently this is where this gets real fun uh currently you can only advertise on premises so if it's rite aid you use Rite Aid as an example. They're closed in this community, so that, that's a good example. You use Rite Aid. Rite Aid can advertise for things Rite Aid sells, does, specials, all those types of things. Rite Aid could not advertise for Kids on the Block event at Lost River Cave because the event is not happening at Rite Aid. It's happening at Lost River Cave. That would be off-premise advertising. Like we were discussing with Uber Eats. <coughs> Correct. 
So if we say, okay, we don't want these on the right of way, but we want to allow them on private property, then we've pretty much undone the off premise. We've pretty much said, okay, now that's done, uh, which is, uh, I'll, I'm not gonna take a position on the floor on that, but I think the on premise, off premise creates challenges for us on the content neutrality. What? So that's dealing with a commercial business like Rite Aid. Does that have application to my front yard and your front yard? Yes. So I would be restricted on my property if I wanted to say, I go to the Kiwanis Thunderfest, I could not do so in my own front yard. Oh. We've got existing and then the possibility of proposed. Okay, because there is nothing proposed at this moment. Right. If we said in the future, nothing on the right of way, so then that forces those events, the Thunderfest, we'll use Thunderfest, good example. Thunderfest, they could, and we kept the on premise only, then Thunderfest could only advertise at the Corvette Museum. Okay. If we drop the off premise and said, okay, you can advertise, it has to be on private property. Then Thunderfest could put up a sign at your house, your house, your house, my place, uh, you know, some business that was a sponsor. I don't know who the sponsors of Thunderfest are, but I'm sure that there are sponsors out there. Uh -huh. Could put that on private property, but that's with dropping the off-premise requirement. But this would ex uh, extend to private property as private property. So this would extend to residential property, which we don't see the volume of the issues, the volume of the of the enforcement is not on private pro is not on residential property, neighborhoods, things like that. It's not now. It's not it's now. Not but now. If, if you change, it's not now. Uh, it's really on the business side, and so that's where yeah. kind of most of my uh, time has been spent. Going to change the whole market. So, so you're saying, <coughs> going back, that some of the flashing the signage we have as an example on the Scottsboro Road. They cannot advertise please go down Tuesday night to Sky Pack to see uh, Reba McIntyre. Currently. Huh? Currently, that is correct. So it can be considered off-premise unless they're a billboard. That's what billboards are for. That is correct. I'm going anyway. She coming to town? No. Oh. Uh, most of the sign regulations are in the zoning ordinance. Uh, we, uh, through Neighborhood and Community Services and our Code Enforcement Division, handled the enforcement of temporary signs. Uh, so that's why I've been uh, tasked with part of this. Uh, but we also have some elements in our own city ordinance. Uh, challenges on the zoning ordinance side is adopted by all six legislative bodies. Uh, it is intended to be a joint county ordinance. Uh, we could have different regulations for city of Bowling Green. Kind of going back to the chart, there was one that said city 16, county 32. You know, we could make some of those, but we need to kind of decide uh, where do we want to go with this. Um, the next steps is really start researching. Uh, developing, presenting, finalizing, really just kind of taking this from this introduction of this conversation to the point of seeing what are some of the other communities, what are the other challenges we're not thinking about, uh, who's already done this before, and then start kind of give and takes and back and forth, and then really just kind of finalize on, okay, this is where we're gonna go. We expect that to take about 12 months. Uh, so this is not intended this evening to be the end all be all. This was just intended to start the conversation and introduce this topic. Uh, you just in the few 10 minutes or 15 minutes I've been talking, uh, you can see how many what ifs and questions and things that's only gonna get more. Uh, also, the organizations that are most impacted by this are going to be with a lot of questions, a lot of concerns. I believe that there are some here tonight. Uh, I don't know if they wanna talk or or not, but I'm sure that they were waiting with bated breath on kind of what, what the topic of discussion and how this conversation was gonna go. Uh, so with that, that's kind of ends everything on my side. 
uh, I'll entertain any more questions or anything that. Can I ask a clarification question, yes. sort of on what the mayor said? Um, if size is the definition, can you have a different size regulation for residential and a versus commercial? Can you have a larger size for commercial mm -hmm. and a smaller size for residential? Yes, okay. we believe so. But you have to be able to justify you know, those differentiations mm -hmm. that you do so that you're not limiting someone's free speech. But we feel like that one we could probably make work based on those Because it's just chains. based on size, not on content. Correct. Okay. Three reindeer rule. Does this come into a play? Does any of this come into play for that? I don't think so. Gene? Okay. The reindeer rule? The reindeer rule on displays at the square and what displays can be there and what can't. Most of you still say that there are some, you won't call them exemptions, but, you know, government can do what government can do. One question many go about, you know, well, can we enforce these? Uh, we cannot enforce ours on Western property. We don't have authority to do that, for example. Um, but what government says on its own property, most time, of course, can create a little bit different. Uh, I would also take the uh, point probably that the stuff that we've got, for example, in Fountain Square Park right now is not signage. It's just decorations. So that brings up an interesting thing that, that Mr. Harmon just said. So if we were to take the most strict approach to this, we, I couldn't place a sign in my yard. And if I do, code enforcement can come talk to me mm -hmm. and take consequences. But Western can do whatever they like. Don't have authority over the state. It's a big fish, little fish world. Yep. They're a bigger it. fish. You I mean, the Supreme Court's a big fish too. What about the different types of right-of-ways? You've got state right-of-way, federal right-of-way, yeah, well, we've had different types of highways. Right, I, mean, I understand. There, you have a, a variety of different right-of-ways, and that's really on the maintenance and the management side. We've had permission to enforce, and really on when it's in right-of-way, we're just picking up, uh, and from the state for a number of years, but because we're willing to do that to protect the community aesthetics of our community and make sure that we don't have uh, signs all up and down the right of way. It's not as much of an enforcement issue at that point because we're doing more cleanup than anything. So if, if, if I tried to wrap it up, in my, you know, is if we allow any kind of signage, we have to allow all kind of signage. That's much it. And if we- You gotta read it. And then, and then thereafter, we're, if we get over that hurdle, then we get into only picking one. That was my other question. One size signage or one maximum size maximum. signage? So maximum. So you could still Cannot have exceed. varying sizes. So let me give you an example. Let's just say we say uh, 16 square feet is the maximum sign allowed. Doesn't mean that somebody couldn't have an eight, a six, a four, or two. They just can't be, they can't put a 32. It is the maximum size. And but they be that shape. It just has no, to be. No, it's it still a square foot. It's feather size or whatever. Right. It's so. just generally we see them in these configurations. But they could put four four by fours out there. That's the number that is chosen. Two side by side, and that would still make a. I uh, would probably write that differently because we've had were, that issue. <laughs> we had that issue. If they were that far apart. There, there's, here's what we know uh, for doing this for several years and looking at James. Uh, there's always somebody that's going to try to figure out a way around. Had it. Had it, right? Uh, we've seen a lot of them, so we'll write what we can to still meet the intent of what we're trying to do. Uh, but there's still going to be somebody that's going to figure it out. And then you get into, well, now it has to be this many inches apart. And we're, I really don't want to create that type of regulation. Uh, after do, overseeing enforcement of this for a number of years, really want to try to simplify this as much as possible. Uh, I think we all do, uh, so that our businesses, our, our organizations can understand, here's the rule, comply with it, and it'll be okay, and not make it more than it has to be. That is our goal. Now, whether or not we can achieve that goal is a whole different thing, but that's our goal is to try to simplify this down. And some of us, real quick, I think Brent's right, this is still going to be weeks, <coughs> if, if not months, I don't know how long um, away. Months. A lot of review, a lot of research. He, he talked about the Supreme Court decision. It was a majority opinion, but the justices were everywhere. They were all over the place on this thing. It, it's kind of hard to come out with a clear Supreme Court decision 
because even those people that agreed agreed in different ways. And, and some of them even came out and said in some of their concurring opinions, well, I think this would still be okay. Um, so go back to your question, for example, about a Thunderfest sign in your yard. I'm not convinced, you know, maybe we'll work our way through that, that that may not be end up being okay uh, because there is a difference between nonprofit speech as well and government and, and commercial speech. And even one concurring opinion said, you know, there still has the ability to regulate commercial speech maybe more than non-commercial. So, again, go back to that. we got a, we got a long way to go uh, before we're going to come up with definitive language about what, uh, part of what we're going to bring back. I know there's questions that we don't even know how to ask, and I invited some realtors here, Lloyd Ferguson, Ron Kirby, and Andy Wilkins are here, and then, what's your name again? Holland, is that right? Yeah, Mr. Holland's sure. here from Signature Signs. Uh, I would appreciate if, if in our discussions that somehow we, we perhaps include some interaction with them because they will they might be able to help us with the what ifs before we get to this part and have to back up and punt again. So Understand. I appreciate you all being here and thank you for If there's opinion. anything they want to add, I'll step aside. Yeah, have you all got anything I've been up in here you'd like to add tonight, Mr. Ferguson? My name's Lloyd Ferguson. I live at 1100 South Park Drive here in Bowling Green, been a lifetime resident. And first of all, I want to commend you all, especially Mr. Childress. He's taken on a mighty big task. And, uh, you know, I, I'm very concerned about our community, the aesthetics, and we live in a fine community. And, and uh, uh, you know, no doubt our signage, it needs to be cleaned up. And uh, I'm probably guilty as anyone else as trying to promote my product and in my industry and, and the ownership of the person I'm trying to represent. But uh, we do appreciate the opportunity of being involved in all the discussion in the very beginning and, and head off any issues or problems that may come up. Um, I'm on the board of directors of our Realtors uh, Political Action Committee and, and the uh, 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 Realtors uh, Southern Kentucky Association. So, and they've asked me to come tonight and, and be sure and, and bring this point out that we want to be involved and we want to be aware and, and help you plan or anything you may need from us. So you have our 100% of participation and support. We're right behind you. Thank you, sir. So thank you. I appreciate you being here too. Question on our sign. Before we, before we close out this meeting, I uh, have an opportunity to, to thank a good friend of mine who's been here for the last six years, who's helped this community advance and work towards uh, a common goal to make this a great place to live, work, worship, and raise a family. Uh, and uh, Commissioner Rick Williams is, uh, was a friend of mine before this, has stayed a friend during this, which is always unusual, <laughs> and be a friend of mine after. And, uh, Although I'm, I get to see him a lot of places, I will certainly miss you being up here. And on behalf of the city of Bowling Green, I have a couple small gifts for you to, to take with you and, and offer you the opportunity if you have any closing comments as well. Thank you, Mayor. I, I appreciate that. And uh, I do want to pass along to a, a few people some thoughts. Uh, first of all, to the citizens of this community, I thank you for the opportunity that you gave me to be of service to this community. And I do, and I made that statement many, many times. I looked at it as an opportunity to serve. I love this community. Um, I love doing what I, what I could to make it a better place. I'm happy that it has, I think it has become a better place um, over, the, over the past six years. I think that this, this commission has continued to work on things that, um, have resulted in a, the city being a better financial position than it's ever been. Um, we're, we have a tremendous group of employees and departments. Uh, you know, our, our police department, fire department, public works department are all certified. We're the only city in Kentucky that can, that can say that. Uh, you know, just taking a look at the work that's done to put together uh, our city's budget it's incredible and if you if you don't know what, how big this business is of our city and you have to look at it that way this isn't fun and games 
uh, it's very important that things be evaluated right and worked on um, by professionals. And I, I think that if you just take a look at our department heads and our management and the staffs, you can see that we do have a dedicated group of employees and a great staff. So that doesn't worry me. Uh, I think they'll continue to do that, and, and I certainly hope so. Secondly, to my friends who have always uh, supported me, I thank them for that support. Uh, you don't know how much it means to me. To my family, I've got to say thank you for the, allowing me to do this because they've made a lot of sacrifices. This job is big. People that think that you come here twice a month for a little two-hour meeting, they don't know what I was involved with being a good city commissioner. You have to listen to the people. You have to talk to the people. You have to investigate. You've got to read the book that comes with the agenda for each and every meeting, and it's important. So I thank my family for the sacrifices that they've made and, and hope that maybe in, in the coming months I can make up part of that to them. I also want to thank God for giving me the wisdom and the vision to be able to look at the things that, are, that come before this commission. I don't deal with anything lightly. I want to make sure that whatever I do and however I stand up, I represent the good citizens of this community. And I thank everybody for giving me that opportunity. Now as I leave, I want to wish you all well. And I hope for the very best for everyone in Bowling Green. I want to wish my fellow citizens a very Merry Christmas and a Happy New Year. And again, thank you very much. That's the last item on our agenda. Our next scheduled meeting will be January 15th, 2019. Thank you for attending in.